ever since It's been a long, a long time coming But I know a change gonna come Oh, yes, it will Sam Cook, a change is gonna come. It's one of the themes of our movement. It holds the power of struggle to end racism and for freedom and equality and was made part of the heartbeat of this film we're about to talk about today. So welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us. We're about to celebrate the 110th anniversary of the birth of Mrs. Rosa Parks, an iconic figure in our nation's history, but one whose real story has been so sanitized that created this myth of sainthood that she was just a tired old seamstress who was arrested on her way home for refusing to give up her seat to a white man on a segregated public bus system in Montgomery, Alabama that led to the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott that gave birth to the civil rights movement and the fame of Dr. Martin Luther King. Well, she did refuse to give up that seat. She was arrested, and it did raise the profile of King to the national spotlight. But Mrs. Rosa Parks was an activist to her bones, a fighter for black freedom and justice. She was secretary of the local NAACP that was an activist branch led by the union leader, Edie Nixon. She fought for the Scottsboro Boys in the 1930s. Her grandfather liked Marcus Garvey and took no nonsense from racist whites in Alabama. Well, let me stop there, and we'll catch up to all of that in this conversation. The myth of Mrs. Rosa Parks was broken in part by a book and a documentary, both called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. The original book was written by Jean Theo Harris, who's the author or co-author of 11 books and numerous articles on civil rights, black power movements, and race in America. Her biography, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, won a 2014 NAACP Image Award and the Letitia Woods Brown Award from the Association of Black Women Historians. And this powerful documentary, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, was co-directed by Yoruba Richin and Johanna Hamilton. Yoruba Richin is our guest today. She's an award-winning and amazing filmmaker, director and screenwriter, and producer. Her film, The Green Book, A Guide to Freedom, was broadcast on the Smithsonian Channel to record audiences and was awarded the Henry Hampton Award for Excellence in Documentary Filmmaking. She is the founding director of the documentary program at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. And I could go on for days about what these two women have accomplished. But let's begin the conversation about Mrs. Rosa Parks on the week of our 110th birthday. Welcome. I'm so happy that both of you could join us today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here. I, I just want to get a, a, a broader question for us to start. Um, and because it comes up all the time, why you think and how it happened that Rosa Parks went from this powerful, militant, take-no-nonsense fighter for freedom into this tired old woman who didn't want to get up out of her seat? As, as as an icon. And I mean, it's a, Yoruba, let me start with you and, and Jean jump in. I mean, wh- how do you think that happened? Why do you think it happened? Uh, you know, I think it happened for a lot of reasons. I think that uh, you have to look at sexism with and patriarchy within the movement, within the civil rights movement, within the black freedom struggle um, that, you know, barely acknowledges the role of women, the vital role of women uh, in, you know, in, in the struggle. Um, we're only now starting to unpack and, and, and uncover that. Um, I think that uh, Mrs. Parks, her personality was not one that uh, was, you know, um, very loud or, um, uh, you know, um, what's the word? Um, you know, quiet strength as one of right. our, as one of our interviewees says. So that also, I, I, um, think, you know, added to the, uh, myth of a meek woman. And as Jean, you know, has told us from the beginning, um, she was never asked about things besides the, uh, boycott. So, um, People did not know, many people did not know of the breadth uh, of her activism and her work. Yeah, I mean, self-aggrandizement was not part of her character. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Jean? I mean, I think we need to think about a few things. One, I think part of the myth actually starts in the boycott itself. 
And it starts because, um, so the Montgomery bus boycott goes from December 5th, 1955 to December 21st, 1956. We are in the height of the Cold War. And almost immediately, um, as, as the boycott begins, as she decides to fight her case in court, rumors snake through Montgomery's white community that she's a communist plant, that she's an NAACP plant, that she's an outside agitator, that she has a car, she's not even from Montgomery, on and on and on. And so what you will see is over the next few weeks, how the black press talks about her, how King and other leaders talk about her, even how Mrs. Parks talks about herself, increasingly background her long political history in favor of this Christian seamstress image. Um, because Mrs. Parks's long political history in 1950s America, right, was a liability for her, for the movement, as was many, many people's civil rights activism. To be a civil rights activist in Alabama in 1956, just to remember, in June of 1956, Alabama outlaws the NAACP as a foreign organization, right? It's red baiting um, civil rights activists. And so part of the myth begins during the boycott itself, which is that the backgrounding of Mrs. Parks's long political history before it even though that's key to why many people um, get to the breaking point when she's arrested and trust that she can withstand the pressure that will come down on anybody who's willing to be a kind of legal case. Um, so people, her politics and her and the way she's known in the community is key to why people rally behind her. But those same politics over the next weeks and months will get backgrounded for the safety of the movement. So that's one thing. I think the, the second point that Yoruba was just mentioning to us is, is the ways that the civil rights movement gets trapped and constrained in part also by the Cold War politics of the time as being a Southern struggle, as being only nonviolent, as being only about things like the desegregation of public accommodations, not about housing discrimination or jobs, not about school segregation in the North. And so like Yoruba was mentioning, all many of the interviews we have of Mrs. Parks, many of the oral histories take place in Detroit, in John Conyers' office where she's working, and they don't ask her anything about Detroit. They don't ask her anything about her work for John Conyers. They don't ask her about Vietnam. They don't ask her about um, uh, what she's doing or, or, or the congressman's agenda. And I think we can see sexism in that as well, right? It seems hard to imagine you have a male civil rights activist turn congressional aide, you would think to say, well, what are you, you know, what are you working on? But with Mrs. Parks, it, and she will lament for decades that she's constantly having, as she talks about it sometimes, to pull off that scab, that she constantly has to talk about that one day. Right. When she, and the title of my book in the film is taken from a quote from her, where she talks about having a life history of being rebellious. Let's talk a bit about that life history. I mean, one of the things that the, that the book and the film um, we can dive into is the early Rosa Parks, the early Mrs. Rosa Parks. But let me stop for a second. That what I just did. I said the early Rosa, early Rosa Parks, and I said the early Mrs. Rosa Parks. <laughs> Yoruba, one of the things that really I think is important to say here as I, as I move on is how important the Mrs. Rosa Parks is to what people just say Rosa Parks. I had, I had to digress in my own head when I heard myself talk. Could you? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I have to, I definitely have to let Jean take this one because she is the one <laughs> who told okay, us fine. from the beginning the importance of the misses. Um, you know, just briefly how I think of it is, you know, it's a sign of respect, obviously. Yes. Um, you know, we had another person, Joanne Watson, in the film, Reverend Joanne Watson, uh, call her Mother Parks, which I yes. also think is, is a, right. a beautiful right. uh, name as well. But Jean really was the one who told us, um, you know, obviously we took the name of the book. We, it's such a fantastic name. And why she had Mrs. Uh, as part of the title. And I think picking up like what you were saying, right, like, most black women of Rosa Parks's age and era were denied that honorific. And so you, all of the people that we interviewed, that I interviewed, right, 
called her Mrs. Parks, in part because that was a sign of respect, a sign of anti-racism, a sign of kind of getting out of the ways. Also, that Rosa Parks had become this commodity that anybody felt like they could access. And part of adding the misses, I think, in my book, and I think in our film, is about saying, you don't just, you know, is a degree of formality, a degree of she is not just ours to take, a degree of you need to, to, uh, how should I say, to, to not just give her kind of a personal respect, right, but a respect of of not feeling like she can just be used. People are constantly comparing themselves to Rosa Parks. And you could probably, you know, Mark, run a whole five minutes of people saying, this They did, This is the Rosa Parks of this. This is the Rosa Parks of that. Right, right, um, right. And so I think part of why I also used Mrs. Rosa Parks in the title was a way to say, we don't just get to fully just take, like to just use her and not have to, know who she is and not to give her the respect of knowing who she is. I think, yeah, that's really important. I mean, we have a history in this country of black women being only addressed by their first name, if that, you know, and without any respect of Mrs., Dr., Miss, whatever that is. And so I think that's really an important point, which is why I, I'm glad we did this. So, um, but let's talk about the roots here. I mean, her roots, she was destined in some ways to be an activist given her grandfather, her, uh, Raymond Parks, the memories of being with her grandfather when the KKK tried to, to intimidate their home and uh, the, the role of self-defense, her mother pushing the value of education, going to Miss White School. I mean, let's just rest with that for a moment, that who she came from, what her roots were. That really speaks volumes about the kind of woman she became. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I think was so revelatory for me in re reading the book and, and making the film was the her family background, how her lifelong um, belief in self-defense came from, uh, as you just mentioned, you know, what being with her grandfather, warding off the KKK um, on her on her porch, and how she wanted to see, you know, her how she wanted to see her grandfather shoot a Kluxer, a Ku Klux Klan person, <laughs> um, right. you know. And that it's so important in, in terms of her um, forming who she was and also how we understand the black freedom struggle. As Jean just mentioned a little while ago, it's often reduced to, you know, nonviolent tactics, that that was the only strategy we had. And that's not true. I mean, we wouldn't have survived if that was the only strategy we have. So I think it's such a um, it's just such a. a a you know a, a really important point to understanding who uh, Mrs. Parks is and and what the freedom struggle is about. And then you know uh, it's also so interesting um, looking at you know our history of you know the history of interracial um, you know unions of of, of rape. Uh, you know her father was very light skinned um, very like, you know, he could pass, but he didn't, <laughs> he was a race, as we say, you know, a race man, he chose to identify as a black person and to, um, you know, and to be, uh, and to take that, you know, which is not, you know, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of things we could say about the history of passing and what that means. And it's fascinating, yeah. but those folks who chose, who could pass and chose to identify as black and acknowledge their, their blackness and, and, you know, is super, super important. And also tells us about, uh, you know, as you said, how it formed her as an activist and also about this country and what the black freedom struggle, you know, has entailed and the, and the, the type of people, you know, who are, are part of it. Um, so I just think it's, those two things are just very, uh, salient for me and understanding who she is and, you know, what it means um, and what it says about our struggle in this country. I mean, picking up what Yoruba was saying, for the Macaulay family, right, to be a respectable person was not just how you comported yourself, but that you expected and at times had to demand respect for her, your person, right? So that's a bedrock belief that her grandfather, that her mother had, right? So we have that 
stitched into a young Rosa McCauley. And then, Mark, like you just mentioned, at age 18, she meets Raymond Parks. Uh, Raymond Parks is a politically active barber. Uh, he is, as she describes him, the first real activist I ever met. And so part of what Raymond does is he takes that inner sort of, you know, militancy that she had sort of, grown, you know, that had, you know, was in her from her family, but shows her the possibility of collective struggle. Because Raymond Parks is one of the local activists working on the Scottsboro case, working around organizing the Scottsboro case, nine young men who'd been arrested um, on a train, riding the train for free, but then that charge gets changed to rape and all but the youngest who's 12 sentenced to death. And so a group of local activists had grown in Alabama to try to defend the Scottsboro boys from being executed. And one of those activists in 1931 was Raymond Parks. And she meets him in 1931. Uh, and so this opens the possibility, not just of a kind of personal demand for respect, right, but a collective struggle is possible, right? And so I think what that opens, uh, and in the first years of their marriage, he is the more public activist. Um, and that's going to change. And then she'll become the more pop public activist. But fundamental to that relationship is this belief that another world is possible and that and that fight to do so. Um, and so we see, we see her, you know, kind of come into her in the 1940s deciding, for instance, that here we have black people serving in World War II like her younger brother, and yet not able to vote at home, right? Not able to access kind of the, the full rights of citizenship at home, and that scalds her. And so this is when she steps forward and joins the Montgomery NAACP and then works with Edie Nixon to transform it into a much more activist branch. Yeah, and it, it, um, for people to even stand up to the Klan in Alabama then, I mean, Alabama is no, is no walk through the park today, but it, it, then it was, a, it, what they stood up for was, it's almost impossible to imagine that, what, that they actually could do that, but he did. You know, let me play this quick clip about Reese Taylor. We're going to jump into this. I remember one case out in Abbeville, Alabama, where my father and his family came from. Mrs. Reese Taylor was on her way home from church when she was kidnapped, forced into a car at gun and knife point, stripped of her clothing, and raped by six white men on September 3rd, 1944. Then put a blindfold on her, took her back and dumped her in the middle of town and said, if you tell nobody, we'll kill you. She went promptly to the sheriff and told him. And they realized that nothing's going to happen to these, these men. Rosa Parks hears about this from a white woman they know through Scottsboro organizing. So Rosa Parks and some of her comrades decide that they should investigate it. Rosa Parks was sent to get the testimony in those times to go 100 miles from home. The sheriff is outside driving by, and he goes again. Well, there he is. I just only can imagine what that must have been like, sitting there and actually having her tell that story and Rosa Parks writing down every word. It was incredibly dangerous for um, a black woman to report, to detail that they had been the victims of sexual violence. For Ms. Parks, it was especially dangerous going into communities because she was seen as the problem. In collaboration with several other activists, they'd go as far as to take out an ad in the local newspaper in order to let people know what had taken place and to place pressure on law enforcement to do something. So let's talk a bit about Reese Taylor, because I think in 1944, this becomes a seminal moment, how it shaped uh, Mrs. Rosa Parks, how it shaped the movement, how it relates to Scottsboro, her husband seeking justice and all this, and her battle around it, her battle. So, and, and, I, and, and to me, uh, again, um, Yoruba, it, it became a central part of the film, I felt, say, setting things up as it was in the book. So, so why don't you both please just get, I really want people to understand who this woman was, um, what happened to her and what the response was. Well, um, I'll just start by saying when I first uh, found out about the Reese Taylor case and uh, Mrs. Park's role in investigating, investigating it, that was only a few years ago. And it was actually when another documentary came out uh, 
about Reese Taylor. And, you know, this is literally only a few years ago. And I was, you know, amazed that I did not know about her work uh, in the South investigating sexual crimes against black women in the 1940s. I mean, you want to talk about, you know, uh, risking your life um, for, uh, you know, for doing this kind of work. It's incredible, incredible, incredible. And, you know, one, one, going back to your previous question of why she's reduced, you know, to just the tired old lady on the bus is that it makes, if you talk about, uh, you know, self-defense uh, and her, you know, belief in self-defense. If you talk about her work investigating sexual crimes against Black women, like you know, what happened to Teresa Taylor, then you have to talk about these issues in our country, right? Then you actually have to talk about, um, you know, why we had to employ self-defense, what sexual violence was going on against Black women at the time, which is, you you know, as you know, it was only white women who were, uh, it was the trope of the white women being raped again, um, and Black women raping white women. I mean, that has been the trope in this country, when that actually was not the case. It was, in fact, the opposite most of the time. So to reduce her is you can, uh, you don't have to talk about these issues in our country. So just mentioning that. But um, so when I, you know, I found out about her work, um, you know, only a few years ago. So we felt it was super important in the film to really expand on that and then to show how um, she has worked, had worked, continues to work on this issue. Um, You know, we, uh, in the film, we also talk about the Joanne Little case and her involvement with that, which was also another case, case of a black woman uh, being raped this time by her her jailer um, and actually getting off. And she was, uh, uh, you know, uh, for self-defense. And Mrs. Parks was um, at the center of, you know, that movement. And this was in the, what, in the late 70s, uh, mid to late 70s. So um, her work around this issue is um, such an important part of who she is. And it's probably one of the most least known parts of Mrs. Parks' work. The fearless Mrs. Parks. <laughs> Jean? I mean, I think one of the things looking at the Reese Taylor case in the film does, and there's a number of other cases that we couldn't include in the film, right? She works on a, a case of Gertrude Perkins, who had also been raped. Uh, she's working also, for her, there's, there's two sides of the coin. There's both the lack of protection for Black people, and particularly Black women, from rape and sexual assault. And then there's the over-incarceration and over-policing of Black people, and particularly Black men, for as Nuruba was saying, the you know, ostensible rape of white women, which often was either consensual relationships or other ways that people had just stepped out of line. And so they're working on other cases. Uh, one that really gets her is a teenager by the name of Jeremiah Reeves, um, right. who is similarly uh, accused of rape He's having a consensual relationship with a young white woman. He's, you know, sort of like the Central Park Five. He's brought in. They sit him in the electric chair until he confesses. He recants that confession. Uh, He's convicted. They fight all the way to the Supreme Court. He gets a new trial because he had an all-white jury. He gets a second all-white jury. And he's, he's again, and so Mrs. Parks is, is working on these cases. And over and over, they're not getting justice. Right. Uh, People aren't aren't indicted. Uh, You know, black people like Jeremiah Reeves, Jeremiah Reeves will be executed when he turns 22 in 1958. So I think another part of the story that we miss when we tell that easy story of somehow she sits down and then people rise up is how much groundwork they lay and how hard it is. And they keep doing it and she keeps doing it. And she talks about over and over how hard it was to keep going, how much pressure there was on people not to, what it meant to be, you know, how how you were treated if you were a troublemaker. And so I think part of the story we're trying to tell in the book and in the film is that story of the 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 length. Because if you actually look seriously at her life right? The easiness of somehow you shine a light against injustice and injustice is changed, right? That's not actually how it works. Um, And so you see over and over them trying things and over and over them being 
discouraged and not getting any justice, right? And she's traveling the state and she's taking down testimony and she's sending affidavits to the Department of Justice and over and over, it doesn't do anything. And so understanding that one of Rosa Parks' greatest superpowers is her ability to keep going while being discouraged, while not being able to see that it's necessarily going to do anything, but that you do it anyways. Because I think the, the ways we tell the story of the civil rights movement is somehow that you, you know that if you step forward, that something will happen. And yet people like Rosa Parks and many other people she's working with step forward time and again mm -hmm. and risk their lives. And, and many of those times, you know, nothing happens and yet they keep doing it. Yeah. And it's just looking out from just Mrs. Park's life, what it tells us about the black freedom struggle in this country. Again, often reduced to, you know, it started with Martin Luther King, then we had integration and everything was fine. You know, right. this is why it's so important to understand that the black freedom struggle starts when we were brought here as slaves. And and continues to this day. And so and that and that idea of you keep going, even in the face of violence and lynching and not getting justice um, is, I think, such an important, um, you know, such an important yeah. point and can hopefully give us some, you know, some energy to continue on today. No, I, I, I'll, I'll let me just say this really, really quickly, both the book and the, and the film. I, and I love them both. Th that's what exactly what they do. When I finished that film the, again the other night, it was giving. I want. I want every younger person to watch. Because it gives you the energy, saying the fight doesn't just end with one thing. It keeps going. They push back. We lose. We fight. We don't give up. And that's what I think is at the heart of all this: is you don't stop. You can't stop. Given what we face and what she faced. So I think that was, it's really, really important. Um, I, I want to talk a bit about this short clip here, but we'll watch. I was going to go along with him to meetings and hear discussions, but he always said it was too dangerous. The police were always on the lookout for people to intimidate. The police killed two men who were connected with the group Parks was with, people Parks knew well. People were certainly concerned with being killed, being imprisoned. Raymond embraced armed self-defense during the Scottsboro campaign. He and I stayed up for many a night and didn't sleep at all. When he left home, I did not know whether he'd be brought in or lying in the street dead someplace. And see, they always were armed wherever they were. They always had something on. And I, I did that because I, I want to talk a bit about how the, 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 the Rosa Parks, as she moved on and also became much more politically astute and aware of things around her and her analysis of what was happening. I mean, she supported them all. King, Malcolm, even Robert F. Williams, the RNA, the Republic of New Africa. You know, and, I, and I, for folks who haven't seen the film, Robert F. Williams, uh, there was a book he put out years back called The Negro, Negroes with Guns in North Carolina where he defended people. Uh, he was a Marine vet and ended up having to live in Cuba. Um, and uh, But she, she supported them all. I mean, so t th th this is the... A, it's part of the, to me, of the political complexity, the complexity of, of Rosa, Mrs. Rosa Parks. It's also, it's also about her holistic approach to what she sees around her. She doesn't, she doesn't have this narrow dogmatic vision. I mean, that, that, it just, that, that says so much about her personality. And, and, and this time, let me start with Jean, and then we'll slide over to Yoruba, that, because, I mean, it's just to kind of talk a bit about what you both discovered in this process about, about that. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that um, when I was first doing research for the book that was so ex both exciting and groundbreaking was this second half of her life in Detroit. Um, just to, as we see in the film, she she loses her job soon into the Montgomery bus boycott. Raymond loses his job. They never find steady work again. Um, they're getting death threats even after the boycott ends. And so they're forced to leave Montgomery and they move to Detroit. So she spends the second half of her life in Detroit, what she calls the Northern promised land that wasn't um, <laughs> right. as right. Uh, a growing movement is happening in Detroit as well. Um, and, and Detroit is one of the centers of a kind of a whole range of black power uh, organizing from 
you know, black power labor organizing to reparations to um, uh, really interesting work around like urban renewal, you know, so many different approaches. Uh, and she's taking part in all of it. One of one of my favorite things in talking to people, I did a lot of talking to uh, people in Detroit and Detroit activists to tell the second half of the story. And over and over, they would say she was everywhere. Uh, and Mark, like you're saying, it was not an either or. It was not Malcolm or Martin or Ella Baker or Queen Mother Moore, right? It was a both and. It was, you know, by any means to show we are dissatisfied was sort of her philosophy. Um, and that she would go where people were doing something useful. Uh, she would just, she would, one of, I mean, one of the things that she understood, right, was that you don't have movements without people being willing to show up and do the work of those movements. And so she does. And she is happy to have young people lead, right? I think another way that we tend to pit the civil rights movement against the Black Power movement is that then these young radicals come up and then these people like, and Parks embraces the kind of vision and energy of young people, both in Montgomery, but then, you know, when they moved to Detroit, in Detroit. And so letting, um, so one of my very most favorite mo moments in the film is when Dan Aldridge is talking about organizing for the People's Tribunal in Detroit, which is yes. a people's yeah. hearing yes. around yeah. police brutality when the cops are not indicted for the murder of these three black teenagers. And they go to her, right, to ask her, will she be on the jury, right? This is really a controversial thing. They have to they have to move it out of a theater they were going to have it in because the theater got so many death threats. Uh, the Michigan Bar Association threatens the the licenses of the lawyers who participate. Um, but they ask her, will you be on the jury? And then and Dan's talking about how he's nervous. He doesn't think she's going to go for it. He's, she says, yes, I'm glad you asked. Right. So this sense of like she will come and support um and, and other people would say, yes, if I, she would say, yes, if I can be useful, I will come. And so that ability also to let young people lead, right? And to let all of these new kind of flowers of black power emerge and for her to sort of do so many of them, right? We see her in so many different and we had to make some hard choices. And so there are things in the film, we don't get to see her at the Black Panther School, even though there was great footage of that. Um, and maybe you but you can. Yeah, well, one thing just in terms of the the filmmaking um, is that what we decided, and I, I think this was the right choice, is that we wanted to have Mrs. Park's voice lead us through the mm -hmm. film. Uh, you know, though we know what she looks like and uh, that picture of her on the bus, many of us had not really heard her voice. And so we made a choice uh, as filmmakers, that she would lead us through. So we are, you know, one of the first, very first things we did was start going through the archive um, of, you know, footage, uh, audio tapes. Um, uh, you know, Jean was obviously incredibly uh, knowledgeable about where a lot of this stuff was. And also remember, we did this during, um, we were still in COVID. And a lot of these wow, places right. were still closed. Uh, one, um, I believe it was the local station in, in Montgomery. We never even got to access because they were just, they were just closed for COVID. So it was, it was challenging, uh, in that way as well. But luckily her, so much of her, um, of her, uh, you know, of her, her, her archive was in the Library of Congress um, and had been cataloged. And, and so that was really, even though, you know, again, as we started, Library of Congress was not open uh, every day. So, uh, but we decided <laughs> that that's how we were going to tell the story. Um, and so there were things that she did not talk about um, that, uh, you know, reparations, for example. I mean, that was a real hard one for me to, to let go. Her, her involvement with, uh, the reparations movement very early on, you know, and how prescient in terms of, you know, where we are today and in talking about and how it's moving to the mainstream. But it was not something that she talked about that we could or wrote about because we also use letters as well as, you know, from the film and had uh, the great actress Lisa Gay Hamilton read. Yeah, she from, was great. She was wonderful. From, yeah. Read from her letter. So that was how we, you know, made those decisions <clears throat> excuse me, of what to include 
and to, to not include. So in the time we have left, there's two areas I really want to hit because I know you, you, you're both very busy. I know you, you have to get rolling soon, Yoruba, so I, I want to get through these quick things here. Um, and just listen to this one clip. I was with the March on Washington in 1963. That was a great occasion, but women were not allowed to play much of a role. The March on Washington is one example of how black women are often marginalized in the civil rights movement. If you look at those who spoke, with the exception of Daisy Bates, who only spoke for a few minutes, the entire program was dominated by men. There was a tribute to women in which A. Philip Randolph, one of the organizers of the march, introduced some of the women who had participated in the struggle, and I was one of them. They would have her stand up and wave at people. There's Rosa Parks. You know, she sat down on the bus in Montgomery. Wave at him, Rosa Parks, Mrs. Parks. And she sat down. They never said anything beyond that. I was 15 when I went to the March on Washington. I stood there in awe of all of the people that had gathered. And I remember Lena Horne moving swiftly to the front of the stage, picked up a microphone and sung two syllables. Freedom! And they lingered in the air. There was a blanket of silence. Lena, she was taking Rosa Parks around to European satellite stations and saying, this is the woman that started Montgomery. This is it. So when I saw her doing that, I joined her. We were determined to see that Rosa Parks was recognized. There's so much patriarchy built into the movement, like it's built into so many institutions. So these women talking about this, I mean, women were at the heart of the movement. Always. I mean, when I was a kid, my hero was the woman who I worked under. Her name was Gloria Richardson. Without her, the Cambridge movement. I mean, she was, you know, I mean, I, yeah. I, 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 so, and women were at the heart of the movement, but, but they were at the back of the bus when it came to history and the media and even in the movement itself. I mean, as your clips, you show the March on Washington and how it was, um, uh, all men speaking, except a couple of women got a chance to come up and say one or two words. So th that's a big part of this. Um, and her role in that is really important in all this. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this is part of why I do the work that I do as a documentary filmmaker. Um, it's reclaiming uh, Black women's space in the, in the struggle, in the movement, which, you know, has long been buried and, and passed over. So, uh, you know, when I got the opportunity to be a part of this film and um, to bring this to, to, you know, to help bring this film to life, I jumped on it uh, after reading Jean's book and um, it expanding my understanding of who Mrs. Parks was. Um, and I knew it was such the right time to tell the story because we are just now. Um, you know, in the last few years, uncovering the essential role of, of Black women in the movement. Yes. I mean, we um, one of the things I think that the Black Lives Matter movement, where we, you know, know that Black women are are at the front of it um, and were um, and are, you know, the 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 main drivers of it. I think that also helped us, you know, to go back and to see um, what you know what uh, the role of of Black women have been in the, in the movement. And so I'm, again, in telling her story, I think we're doing exactly that. And it's such important work. And so much more needs to be done. I mean, Gloria Richardson, you mentioned, I did not know who she was until making this film. Uh -huh. um, and I will have to say, sadly, we um, talked to, when we talked to, I think it was her daughter or her mm -hmm. granddaughter. We mm -hmm. literally emailed it her was, the day yeah. She the died. day, yeah, she died. Oh, really? Rose wow. Yep. Yeah. I had, I had, you know, I knew um, Miss Richardson and I had, we'd reached out and literally we hear the next day before it even breaks in the media, like from her daughter that she had died the day before. And um, I mean, Gloria Richardson is one of those people on the dais during the March on Washington. Gloria Richardson was a house, as you know, Mark, a household name in 1963, right? But now 
right? I mean, only recently, right, with Joseph Fitzgerald's biography and some, you know, and other work, we're starting to reclaim that history. But Gloria Richardson talks about how both the marginalizing of women and women had protested that marginalizing at the March on Washington, right. but also literally her and Lena Horn going around to international news stations and taking Mrs. Parks and saying, this is where it began. You need to be interviewing her. And she believes that they get sent home early from the march because of that, that they'd kind of gone off script. And so they're, they're put in a cab supposedly for their safety. Uh, she says they, she, you know, they, they don't even hear King's speech at the, you know, they're, um, you know, they're sent home. And so, so there's that, that other story to tell, right. Which is that, that more complex. Um, and again, it is a story that, that people were contesting at the time. Mrs. Parks, says to Daisy Bates, you know, that day, right, that she wished this was not happening. People like Polly Murray, people like Dorothy Hyde, people like Anne Arnold Hedgeman at right. the time. So it's not, sometimes people are like, oh, we're putting a presentist, um, you know, we're taking a lens that people didn't have. No, they had it. Um, <laughs> yes. People are raising those <laughs> questions. And so, That's a really um, important point, Gene. A powerful point. And I, I, I know we have to conclude this. I don't want to conclude this, but we have to. I know I could go on for just have this conversation with you all forever. But <laughs> but I but I I wanted to ask you both. There's so much more to cover on both the book and the documentary. What it what is the unsanitized version of Mrs. Rosa Parks that is really important for today's world to understand and and put their arms around? I mean, I, I think, let, let's kind of conclude with that. I just think it's really important to get to. Um, I cut all the other stuff out because we have to get to some place, and let's get to that place. <laughs> you, Ruby, you want to, you look like you're about to jump in, so please do. I don't know if this is exactly what you're, you're getting at, but one of the things that we haven't discussed yet is the ramifications to her life about yes. what she did. So yes. the unsanitized version of Mrs. Parks is that she, after, she was run out of Montgomery after... Uh, her work, her her uh, what she did in the with the boycott uh, and on the bus. She was threatened. Her life was threatened. Her economic uh, she you know was fired from her job. Uh, she was not offered a job by the SCLC by King's organization. Um, and you know black people also shunned her because she was a troublemaker. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the unsanitized version of Mrs. Parks that she was the the sacrifice and the risk that she took uh, to make the stand that she did. And it wasn't easy. Um, you know, again, another version we have of, of our icons and heroes is they do this thing and then this great thing and then, you know, everything's great. And that's not the case. No, it is not the case. <laughs> it's not the case, right. I think another aspect of the unsanitized version of Rosa Parks is if we see that one of her lifelong, you know, works is around challenging the injustices of the criminal legal system, challenging police brutality, challenging the way the law does not protect black people, challenging the over incarceration of black people. If we see her working on reparations, if we see her doing all this anti poverty work, if we see her challenging US foreign policy in Central America, in South Africa, after 9 11, right, we are forced to both confront where we are today in this country and what needs to happen. But also, I think one, some of the falseness we've seen around Black Lives Matter, where people are constantly are telling young people, you know, you should be more like the civil rights movement. You should be more like King and Parks, right? And it's just like, you know, you have no idea, right? And this, this, this misuse of the civil rights movement against contemporary activism is both inaccurate, but it, it also, I think, misses how disruptive they were, how reviled they were, how red baited they were, how they lost their jobs, right? So many of the things that actually happened to people. So now we tell this nice story of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King to make ourselves as a country, I think, feel good about our ability to change. And, and I think to tell an unsanitized version is to really challenge us both what we need to do in the present and also the ways that we, we treat our troublemakers today. And long live the troublemakers. I think you're exactly right. I, I, what I want to see is people say, is people to, to say, yes, this is Rosa Parks, this is Rosa Parks, this is Martin Luther King, this is Malcolm X, this is who they really were, this, this is who Gloria, this is Gloria Richardson. Be them. 
be them. I think that's, you know, that I, I walked away from the film and the book just absolutely juiced. I, I just, they're, they're both amazing pieces of work. And, uh, and I, I just want to thank you both for being here today. And I encourage people, if you can get into Peacock, <laughs> please watch this film, The Rebellious, the Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. Just an amazing piece of work. Uh, and read the book, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. Um, both two powerful pieces of work for one of the most important people in our history. And I want to thank both of you for the work you do. And thank you both for taking the time here for The Real News and The Mark Steiner Show. And uh, thank you both so much. Thank, thank you. you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today with Yuva Richen and Jean Theo Harris about the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. You can see the documentary on NBC Peacock and buy the book online or at your favorite bookstore. You deserve both to see the film and read this book. And once again, thank you all for joining us today. Please let me know what you thought about what you heard today, what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com and I'll get right back to you. And while you're here, please go to www.therealnews.com forward slash support, become a monthly donor, and become part of the future with us. So for Cameron Grandino, Kettle Rivera, and Adam Coley, and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care, and take no shit.